Last week I started refactoring a rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock game. I'm more of a Riker person. William T. Riker, you know, the evil counterpart. That's by far my favorite. I prefer the evil William Riker over the not so evil one. I really love those Mirror Universe Star Trek episodes. Not. I have no idea why they did that. I always skip these episodes. If I get a Mirror Universe episode, I just skip it. I really don't care about it. So if you're somehow involved in producing Star Trek series or movies or whatever, forget about the Mirror Universe. Just, you know, ignore it. Don't, don't put it in the series anymore. Is it? I hate it. I, I really hate it. Anyway, that's not what this video about. Spock is also pretty cool. I mean, let's be honest here. Last week, I mainly worked on separating the user interface, printing things, reading things from the inputs from the game logic. Today, I'm going to take a closer look at the game logic itself and improve a couple of things there and finish the game. If you want to become better at designing code, knowing what kind of decisions you need to take when you look at a piece of code and you need to start refactoring it, I've written a guide for you that's available for free at ariamcodes.com slash design guide. It contains the seven steps that I take when I design a new piece of software. And hopefully that also helps you get started. So ariamcodes.com slash design guide. Link is also in the description of this video. And now let's complete the refactoring of this game. In the first part of this refactoring, I mainly concentrated on separating the printing from the actual game logic. And what we ended up with is that we created a command line interface class that has a couple of methods for picking player entities, displaying things like the current round and the rules, and move all that code out of the game class that now only contains the actual game logic. So there's a do turn method that does a single turn, and there's a play method that actually plays the game. There's one area in the code where there's still some printing involved outside of the CLI, and that's in the scoreboard because scoreboard still has a display scores method. So let's fix that right away before I continue with the rest of the refactoring. So in order to fix this, I need to move this code right here into my command line interface. I already made a display scores method for that in the previous part. So let's put that code right here. And now of course we need to go through the user and score in the scores dictionary that gets passed as a parameter like so and the rest of the code i'm not gonna change so that's display scores and now i can go into the scoreboard i can delete display scores and i go into the game class and there i'm going to call self dot ui dot display scores and then i'm going to pass the scoreboard dot points and this should be self dot scoreboard dot points Another thing we can fix right away is that there is an i variable here that actually can be an underscore because we're not using the variable. So let's fix that also right away. And now let's take a closer look at the game class and how the rules have been set up. So what we have at the moment is that there is a class rules that contains a dictionary rules that maps tuples of entities to which one is the winner and what the message is. And then rules has a get winner method to compute which entity is the winner. It returns the entity, a tuple of an entity and the string. And I think we can simplify this by actually not using a class at all, but simply having rules as a constant. So I'm going to delete this class right here. And let's take all this code and let's de-indent that like so. So this is our rules constant. Let's also turn this into an uppercase constant name to follow the standard way that we do this in Python. And let's now take a look at how the rules are being formulated because as I said in the first part there's some duplication here because the winner that we return is always the first entity in the tuple. So there's actually no need to store the winner. And if we don't need to store the winner then we don't need to store a dictionary that contains multiple things because there's only going to be the message. So instead we can just create a dictionary and that is going to be a tuple of two entities to a string, which is the message. So this is what it's going to look like. And I should remove these extra square brackets here that are not needed. So we have dictionary that maps a tuple of two entities to a string message. And let's actually also remove the duplication from the message because the message also mentions again the entities. 
So what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to return the verb and then we can construct the message from the verb and the two entities that we have. So let's update this dictionary now. And also the paper doesn't disapprove Spock, it disproves Spock. Very important detail. There we go. By removing the duplication from rules, we basically removed half of the code from the data structure, which really simplifies it a lot. Let's now take a look at the get winner method. So let's also de-indent that because it's no longer a method, it's going to be a function. So we remove self and what we're going to get is two entities and we need to return a tuple of an entity and a string. And also here we can use the built-in types. We don't need to import tuple anymore from typing in a more recent version of Python that I'm using. I'm using 3.10 and we can now look at get winner and use the new rule structure to construct what get winner should return. I'm also going to remove this documentation because it's taking up a lot of space. And now what we see is there is basically two options. If this tuple is in the rules, then we're going to return this. Else, if this tuple, so that's the other way around, is in rules, then we're going to return this. And otherwise we're going to return a key error in valid entities. The main thing that we need to change and get winner is that we use the rules constant that we defined above and that we specify the winner and we construct the message from the verb that we get. So let's look at the first case. So entity one is the first one in the tuple. So entity one is actually the winner. So let's change this to the rules variable. And then what we're going to return is entity one, which is the winner. This we delete and now we can construct the message using the value of rules. So that's an F string and we provide entity one dot name and we read the verb from the rules constant. Like so, that's the first case. And for the second case, we can do something very similar. Just going to copy this and now we just need to swap around the entities. Like so, that's our new get winner function. So this really reduced the complexity of the rules file because we now have a simple constant and a single function that uses the constant to determine who is the winner. So let's go back into the game class to update the logic to include this. So that's going to be part of the do turn method in the game class. Let me close the terminal. And that's basically what's happening here. So now instead of using self.rules, we're simply going to call get winner and we need to import get winner obviously. And that's going to give us the winner and the message. And now I can remove the rules class here because that's of course no longer there. That's also deleted here. And let's just make sure that there are no references to self.rules and that doesn't seem to be the case. So that's nice. Let's run this just to make sure that it still works. So that seems fine. And now also you can see that paper actually disproves Spock and not disapproves Spock. I mean, you could never disapprove Spock. Who would disapprove Spock? Okay, lizard. Still, I'm on a roll here. I think I'm gonna win off the CPU this time. Oh man. Nice, nice. One more thing I like to do with the rules. What I don't like is in the game logic in do turn, we check that if these two entities are the same, then it's a tie. I actually think that's not the responsibility of the do turn method here. I think the get winner method should take care of that case. So I think this part should actually be in get winner. So let me copy this because I think that makes a bit more sense and we can put it in here so we can just write let me just do it like this. If entity one equals entity two, then it's basically a tie. So what we can then do is that get winner doesn't return an entity, but it returns an optional entity. Because if there's a tie, there's no winner. So we're going to return none 
and then we're going to return the message. It's a tie. And now what we can do in the game logic is we simply call this and then if not winner, so there's no winner, then self.ui.display tie return. It's not shorter code. It actually adds a couple of lines of code, but I think conceptually this is cleaner than how it was before. But perhaps you disagree. Let me know in the comments what you think about this. So if there's no winner, we display tie and we return. And actually we don't even need to return here because we can combine this with the other if statement. So we're just handling the three cases. So either we don't have a winner, then we display a tie. If the winner is the user entity, then we display this. And otherwise the winner is the CPU, and then we display this. So I think that's pretty nice. Let's also improve the naming of it. So I think this shouldn't be called user entity. We should call this player entity instead. So that it maps with the rest of the naming in the, in the other classes. And the same thing for the user, which we'll call the player name. And the same thing for CPU, we should call the CPU name as that's a bit cleaner. And this import is actually no longer needed. Now let's do a bit more cleanup in the game class. I still don't like this initializer. I think there's still too many things happening here. One thing that we can still move out of the initializer, I think, is the registration thing. I mean, you could leave it in here, but I think it's also nice to add it to the play method instead. So what I'm going to do is remove that here and in the play method. So before I display the rules, I'm going to register the players in the scoreboard. And let's also add a comment here to that we're displaying the rules of the game like so. And there's a couple of other things as well, like we have a max round here, but the max round is actually not used anywhere except in the play method, because that's where it's basically used as a range, as a value for the range in order to determine how often we're going to do a round. So instead of putting it as a member variable in the game class, you could actually also pass it as, a, as an argument to the play method. So let's do that. So in play, we're going to have a max rounds. I would then call it, that's an integer and default, that's going to be five. And we're going to change it here to use max rounds instead like so and now again we shorten the initializer of the game class also this comment is not really needed and this comment also doesn't really say that much in my opinion so let's also delete that so now we have really simplified the game class a lot let's also remove this part of the initializer like so because that's no longer needed so we have a ui we have a scoreboard we have a player name and we have a cpu name i think these are the only four things that you really need to keep as state variables because they're going to be used by both the do turn method and they're also going to be used by the play method. So now, because the initializer are actually really simple, we could actually turn game into a data class. Like so. And now let's add the variables here. So we have the scoreboard, which is of type scoreboard. We have the interface, which is of type UI. We have the player name, which is a string and we have the CPU name, which is also a string and we can give it a default value like so. Now let's delete the initializer. And now the nice thing is because scoreboard is now actually a member variable, an instance variable of game, we can pass it through game via dependency injection. So game no longer creates a scoreboard. We just pass it an object of that type, which is also a bit cleaner. So in the main file, let's create a scoreboard and pass it to the game, like so. Let's run this just to make sure it still works. Man, I'm on a roll today. I'm really on a roll. I'm kicking the butt of this CPU player. Yeah, so let's go back into the game class and do a bit more cleanup. So one thing I mentioned in the first part is that there is actually a law of Demeter violation here in that we're directly updating the points in the scoreboard. And that's actually bad. Instead, what you can do, because scoreboard is class, we can actually add a method to scoreboard to do that job for us. So we don't have to know about the implementation details of scoreboard. So I'm going into the scoreboard class. So now it only has a register player, but now we can add an extra method here to indicate that a player has won a round. So let's add a method win round self player name 
it's going to return none. Actually, register player, that's also going to be none. And what we're going to do here is self dot point player name plus equals one. And let's clean it up a little bit more so we can use the type directly like so. So we don't need this typing import. And what I like to do is also simply use this as the initialization code because it's a bit shorter. So really clean. Comments, I don't think that's needed here. And then this is not needed. You could also use a data class for the scoreboard if you wanted to. Here, because scoreboard is really simple, I don't think it makes a huge difference. So now, instead of directly updating the points here in the do turn, what we can do is call the win round method. Scoreboard win round self dot player name. And then this line we remove. And here we do exactly the same thing. And then the CPU is going to win in this case. Now there's still one issue. I'm not entirely convinced that this is the right way to do it. But here I had a display scores method as part of the UI class. And that gets the points from the scoreboard. But you could argue that this is actually also a violation of the law of the meter. Because now the game needs to know that scoreboard has a points object as a points dictionary. So that would actually be the same problem that we just fixed by introducing the method to the scoreboard class. So there's a couple of ways around this. One is that we pass the scoreboard object to display scores, but then display scores needs to know about the implementation details of the scoreboard. So that doesn't really solve it actually. Another thing you could do is that scoreboard actually gets a UI object in order to display itself instead of calling print. And that way you would avoid the issue altogether. So let's make that change and let's see what that looks like. So what we can do here is we could have a method to display and that gets a UI that's of type UI. Doesn't return anything. But what this does is UI.display scores and then we're going to pass it self.points. And then in the game class, we call self.scoreboard dot to display and we pass it the UI. And then this line deleted. So now game doesn't know anything about the data structure of the scoreboard, which I think is nice. And scoreboard relies on the UI, but that's generic. So that's fine. We can still use this with all kinds of different UIs as long as they implement the UI protocol. Now I must say this is a minor love Demeter violation in my in my opinion because the point structure is not directly modified by this, but this still feels a bit cleaner to me. An alternative, what you could do is add a getter method to scoreboard that gets the points in a basic structure and then you do that in the game class and you pass it to the display because now there is some light extra coupling for the scoreboard on the UI and maybe we want to restrict that to the game class. That's that's possible. Or alternatively, what you could also do is that scoreboard actually has a two string method that gives a multi-line string representation and we simply pass that to the, um, to the display component. But the disadvantage there would be that we would have texts in multiple places. And if you do, if you need to translate the game to other languages, then this is going to be a bit harder to change. So as you see, when you make these design decisions, there's not ever really a perfect decision that is the, the, the best solution for this. It's always kind of a balance between what you expect you are going to need to change in the future, keeping things simple, but still generic and make sure that you're not uh, over-designing things, basically. So that's how I want to leave the scoreboard for now. So to complete the refactoring, I want to take one more closer look at the command line interface and the code that we put in there. Basically, what I did was copying the code over from the original version of the game class. And there are a couple of minor things we can still do to improve this. One thing, for example, that I don't really like is that entities are integers and this code re heavily relies on entities being integers in that the value here that's an integer value that's generated by the auto function in the entity enum let me show you what i mean the problem with using enumerated values in this way in my opinion is that it's a bit dangerous because if you change the order of these things 
then the values are going to change as well. Now, normally, if this is really an isolated application, it doesn't really matter. But if you're storing those things in a database, that can quickly lead to problems. So what I like to do generally with my enumerated values is not use integers, but strings, actually. And that's going to change a few things because it means we need to update the command line interface to be less reliant on those integer values, like here, for example, or here in what the available choices are and things like that. But we can fix that and then we'll have reduced the dependency on specific integer values and we can use strings instead, which is, in my opinion, a bit cleaner. So let's go into the entity enum and let's change this now to use strings instead of integers. So that's really easy. We can simply replace the auto function calls by the actual values here. And the nice thing is we can now also specify how we should write them to the screen. So we have rock, paper, scissor, Spock, and lizard. And then what I would do is instead of using a wrapper, I would actually use the string dunder method because this is going to be the actual string representation that we want to show to the player. And what this is going to return is very simple. That's going to be self.value. So really short, we can delete this. So that's our new entity enumerated value. And now what do we need to change in the command line interface implementation? Well, a couple of things. First, we need to update this, which is going to display the entity choices. And what we're going to do here is, well, we still need to read an integer value, but we don't have integers anymore as entity enum value. So we need to generate those. And that's actually pretty simple because instead of using entity value and instead of using this for loop, we're going to enumerate. So for index entity in, and we can simply enumerate if I can actually type that over the entities. And that's going to give us the index. So what we're going to write here is index and we do plus one, otherwise we start at zero and that's not really what you want the users to enter starts at one. And then we don't need nc.name because we have a string dunder method. So this is then what we get. Let's save this. Now here we can actually simplify this a bit because this available choices thing, we don't really need it. We can simply check that the choice that the player selects is within the range of the entity enum. So this I'm going to delete and I'm simply going to check that choice is going to be between one and length of entity plus one. And of course I need to swap this around. So this needs to be here, else print, please select from the available choices like so. And what we also need to do is fix, fix this line because that's not going to work. So we need to get the item in the entity at the choice index. So what we can do to do this, what we can do to fix this is turn entity into a list and then access it like so we should subtract one. We also need to change this in CPU entity. We can actually replace these two lines by a single line of code like so. We can rely on random.choice for this. And we're going to pick randomly one of the entities from the list that we create from the enumerated value. Let's delete these two lines. And now let's verify that this still works. I'm going to run the code here enter my name and now let's play the game. I pick Spock. Let's also check that putting numbers outside the range works correctly. So if I enter nine, then I'm going to get please select from available choices. And if I enter a character like this, then I'm getting also a correct message. So I think we went far enough in this refactoring session. There's of course other things you can still do to improve this. For example, we have a display rules method in the command line interface that actually hard coded displays the rules here. We could maybe generate this from the rules or something. I think that would be nice. And it would be nice to have a version of the game that also uses a, a user interface that's different from the command line interface just to see whether that works correctly. But overall, we've ended up with a nice short game class that only has do turn and play. Printing and reading information from the player is cleanly separated from the game logic, so that's also pretty good. We might be able to look at do turn more closely and improve this code right here because there is some duplication here in that regardless of who the winner is, we're going to display who the winner is and we're going to pass that information to the scoreboard. So perhaps there might be a way to refactor this piece a bit more 
to make it still a little bit shorter. Maybe if you have thoughts about that, do share them in the comments. Thanks again to Asif for supplying the code to this game. I really enjoyed this refactoring. I hope you enjoyed watching it too. If you did, give this video a like. If you want to learn more about software development and design, consider subscribing to this channel. Thanks for watching. Take care. Live long and prosper.